Okay, in this video we're just going to finish off looking at common access resources and how indirect taxation can be used to try and preserve common access resources. So remembering that taxation is used to influence relative prices and alter the incentives of producers and consumers. So certain types of pollution reduce the quality of air and can lead to a depletion of common access resources. So climate change. Climate change, a stable climate is, a, is an example of a common access resource. Everyone has access to a stable climate. It's not excludable, but it can be rivalrous in consumption because when we burn fossil fuels, that can release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and cause a warming of the planet. So the fact that we have a stable climate, perhaps in the past, is an example of a common access resource. This can have negative implications because it can reduce the ability of future generations to access favourable weather conditions that they need to preserve their living standards. So these favourable weather conditions are an example of the common access resource. So potential costs of climate change, and again, this sort of relate, relates back to what we were doing with negative externalities. externalities. It can lead to increased damage of homes. It can hurt essential infrastructure because we have things like um, natural disasters and cyclones. Um, it can lead to typhoons, hurricanes, cyclones, etc. Um, it can also increase the intensity of droughts and reduce the productive capacity of our economy. So when, when firms experience droughts and floods and things like that, that reduces their productive capacity and can hurt the living standards of society because it can reduce our GDP and our overall income per person. It can also lead to things like destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is an example of a common access resource. Everyone has access to the Great Barrier Reef um, and it's, it's rivalrous because our production is having some impacts and hurting the Great Barrier Reef and bleaching it. So basically what the government did is they implemented a carbon tax on the 1st of July 2012, that tax was initially set at $23 per tonne and it was put on the top 500 polluting firms. So basically the top 500 polluting firms had to pay that cost and they often passed that on to their consumers which therefore affected many other um, consumers and businesses as well. So the tax increased the cost of production for firms using fossil fuels and provided with them with an incentive to alter their production methods. So households decided that all right, now that we've got a higher relative price for carbon, they're likely to more shift their energy consumption to more renewable energy sources um, to try and avoid paying the higher electricity costs. And therefore, more resources shifted to the cheaper renewable energy. And they helped to save, um, there was a 17 million, dollar, 17 million ton reduction in carbon emissions. And the idea of that was to help reduce the damage to the atmosphere, mitigate the, ch the damage associated with climate change, and help to preserve one of our common access resources, which in this case was access to stable weather patterns. Okay, so you need to be able to use that terminology of what the carbon tax was, how it internalised the cost and increased the cost of carbon electricity, and therefore it provided an incentive for households to change their, uh, their patterns of behaviour. The benefits for efficiency... By internalising the negative externality, it reduced the over-allocation of resources towards polluting industries, and it helped us to achieve a more socially optimal allocation of resources. So resources shifted away from these um, harmful um, non-renewable energy to more renewable energy sources, and it provided an incentive for firms to look at new ways to produce better production techniques and using more renewable energy, e.g. installing solar panels, which helps to um, lower the amount of emissions. It's also a lot um, more productive and cheaper to run um, solar panels in the long term, but um, there needs to often be an incentive for people to buy them in the short term. So the tax resulted in lower pollution levels, so the air in the atmosphere was preserved, or the common access resource was preserved for future generations. It boosted intertemporal efficiency because future generations will have more stable weather patterns and cleaner air. So by reducing the negative externality, which in this case the negative externality was the fact that these emissions were causing um, um, greenhouse gas emissions, which was causing all these unstable weather patterns and cyclones and droughts and so on and so forth, that's the negative externality. By stopping that, we're able to preserve the common access resource. So the link between negative externalities and common access resources by limiting the amount of the negative externality, um, we're able to preserve the common access resource. That's the link you need to be able to make. Reduce the negative externality, preserve the common access resource. Subsidies can also do the same thing. So subsidies can encourage the development of cleaner technologies that are less likely to harm the environment. So the Renewable Energy Target Scheme, uh, which is basically the government is subsidising businesses to conduct research and development in, into renewable energy, like wind and solar and geothermal energy, so those subsidies help to reduce the cost of production for these firms and like the tax, it reduces 
uh, it changes relative prices. So in this case, we're reducing the relative price of renewable energy rather than increasing the relative price of non-renewable energy and encourages firms and households to change their buying decisions. This innovation process can help to um, preserve the common access resource because there's less pollution and therefore more stable weather patterns. So it's by supporting the innovation process and helping with the implementation costs, the government is promoting action that will help to reduce the impacts of climate change and promote into temporal efficiency and preserve that common access resource. Challenges with common access resources. Often, often common access resources require international cooperation. So for example, um, with climate change, because climate change is caused by pollution all around the world, international cooperation was necessary to try and mitigate the impacts of climate change. So what they tried to do is they tried to get all the companies, the countries to come together and sign the Kyoto Protocol, which is basically an, an agreement where every country agreed to cap their level of emissions or reduce their level of emissions. The plan was to do it through a cap and trade system, which basically meant that um, basically every, every country got a certain amount of emissions that they were allowed to use and they got a permit for each level of emission. If they wanted to use more than their amount of permits, what they could do is they could sell emissions from other countries. So, sorry, they could purchase um, permits from other countries. So if Australia, say, got given a permit to, to have one million tonnes of emissions and we wanted to, sell, to use slightly more, we have to buy some of them off another country that perhaps didn't need theirs because they were more um, energy efficient. Um, the European Union have also tried the same scheme um, with the idea that these permits could be traded in a market. But one problem with common access resources is you often need international cooperation to make them work. Thank you.